F1 tyres sometimes go bang in spectacular fashion. They can be fine for 50 laps, then explode with no warning, all while the driver is doing 180 miles per hour into a corner. But why? What is really happening when a tyre gives up? Today we're going to look into some of the most insane tyre explosions and how F1 cars manage to literally rip their tyres apart. If you're a long time F1 fan, you'll know that the tyres break pretty frequently. And this can happen in a number of interesting ways and we're going to go over that but first to understand why they go bang let me explain how they're put together. A Formula 1 tyre is made up of a mixture of synthetic and natural rubbers combined with other materials like carbon black that are layered and then cured in a mould under extreme heat and pressure. The intense heat and pressure produces a reaction between the materials that combines their short chains of molecules into longer ones creating a tyre compound. These longer chains give the tyre the elasticity to cope most of the time with the extreme loads of F1. This compound is supported by a mixture of Kevlar, nylon and polyester that makes up the sidewall, the carcass and the tread around the outside of the tyre. And this helps the tyre withstand the incredible loading under acceleration braking and turning. And finally, the tyre is not just filled with air, they're actually inflated with dry nitrogen gas. This is because when air gets warm, it changes its volume more than nitrogen, meaning tyre pressures also change. And using nitrogen means that tyre pressures are much more consistent. Now we know how tyres are made, we need to understand the extreme loads that they have to deal with while out on track. Using Cops Corner at Silverstone as an example, it's a flat out right hander taken at around 180 miles an hour and one of the best corners in Formula 1. And just think about what the tyre experiences here. You're doing 180 miles an hour with two tonnes of downforce pushing the car into the ground. You turn the steering wheel and the car carries that load the whole way through the corner. And then you have these pieces of rubber that are the only thing connecting the car to the track. They're also being squashed and moving around with not that much nitrogen in them. They are being squashed, pulled, compressed and rotated at around 2200 RPM or 35 rotations every second and the poor tyre has to perform like this for at least 30 minutes straight. But COPS is simple, it's flat out and smooth, it's just a high speed corner. Which is easy for me to say while I'm sat here in the studio, but it can get even more extreme. For this we have to head over to Spa and Eau Rouge. While COPS is nice and flat, Eau Rouge is a full throttle left, right, left with 134 feet of elevation, which is the equivalent of climbing a 12 storey building. This means that the tyres have to deal with up to 5G of compression as the car bottoms out and climbs up the hill. That makes the load around 4,000 kilograms. So the 800 kilogram F1 car is now essentially a small truck. And it's not just vertical forces either. Because of the multiple direction changes, the tyres have to deal with lateral loads of up to 4G at the same time as being compressed, all without the driver lifting the throttle pedal. Then we have Degna 1 at Suzuka. This right-hander at the top of the hill is super high speed. The cars approach at over 170 miles an hour, change down one gear and throw the car into the apex. As a result, you get incredible photos like this one of Nico Rosberg in 2016. The compression at the apex is incredibly high as all the weight transfers to the outside tyre, experiencing around 3G of lateral load at the same time as two tonnes of downforce squashing the tyre into the track. And then there is the biggest of them all braking, which is something the cars do dozens of times a lap. And in the really big stops, the forces are insane. Just get this. At Monza, the cars reach 220 miles per hour and break all the way down to 50 miles an hour for turn one. So when the driver is standing on the brakes, and I do mean standing, the tyres give them the grip to stop at over 5G. And according to AWS, the brakes create a peak of 20,000 kilowatts of power into turn one at Bahrain. And that works out to be the equivalent of 26,000 horsepower. And so that is the equivalent of 8,500 horsepower going through each of the front tyres when the driver is standing on the brakes. Now, it's easy to think that the tyres have a lot going on with a thousand horsepower under acceleration, but the braking is the real killer. So it's incredible that these tyres can deal with these forces for even one lap, but they can do it for 50 laps or more at times. So why do they sometimes seemingly just randomly blow up? Well, I've got a few examples to explain this. First one is Beltry Bottas in 2018, which is a great example of how these tyres can fail spectacularly with the slightest puncture. He ran over a small piece of carbon that had broke off Pierre Gasly's car 
earlier in that race, leading to a puncture at over 190 miles per hour. And don't forget that the car will be producing a lot of downforce at this point. So a small cut in the tire caused the structure of the tire to fail and end his race. Next is overheating, which can happen for different reasons. The driver pushes too hard or the compound is too soft and so heats up too quickly and basically melts. This happens a lot, but is often so detrimental to lap time that the team pits the car before things go too far. But one of the weirdest cases of overheating was Daniel Kvyat during the 2020 British Grand Prix at Silverstone. And this was a weird one because it seemed like the tide just popped off the rim with zero warning. And it was pretty early on in the stint. According to Pirelli, a mechanical failure caused his wheel rim to overheat, which in turn burnt the edge of the tire, causing it to separate from the wheel as he headed into the high speed maggots corner. It could have been something like a brake dragging or a failure inside the wheel, but it was certainly an unusual failure. The next failure also happened at Silverstone. In 2013, four cars had the same failure on the left rear during the race because of the low pressure that teams were running. The teams run low pressure sometimes because it does actually give the car more grip. But these low pressures meant that the structure of the tires weren't rigid enough to handle the high loads at Silverstone. Pressure in the tire actually supports it and makes it stronger. So when there isn't enough pressure, the tire deforms much more. So every rotation of the wheel through every corner and every braking phase means that the tire is actually squashing and working the structure much harder. Just like when you bend a ruler too far too many times, the material can't handle it and it fails. And this is what happened to the shoulder of the tire. The joint between the sidewall and the tread of the tire was just pushed too far. Out onto blistering. This is where the tread of the tire overheats. So you can get local areas that melt and break away from the tire to a point where you're losing big chunks of rubber. Over time, this can weaken the tire's construction, causing it to fail. But again, this overheating is so detrimental to performance that teams often pit before the tire fails. Another way that tires can fail is through vibrations. During the 2005 European Grand Prix, Kimi Raikkonen badly flat spotted his right front tire while lapping back markers. And back in those days, you actually couldn't just change your tires during the race. So Kimi was stuck with it. It's a really difficult situation when you've flat spotted your tire. And that's actually a really easy thing to do. So what happens is the flat spot tends to get worse and worse because where it goes flat on the tire, as you brake the next time, that flat part comes back around to the track and it's more likely to lock up again with the flat spot getting worse and worse. By the last lap, the vibration had got so bad it had weakened other components on the car. And when Kimi hit the brakes going into turn one, it caused a massive suspension failure and sent him into the barriers. Now, this wasn't technically a tire failure but was caused by the tires and sometimes it can be as simple as wearing the rubber of the tire away and the most famous tire failure in f1 history was because of this Nigel Mansell was in position to win the 1986 F1 World Championship when his tire exploded on the main straight at close to 200 miles an hour. He had worn through the tread and was basically running on the carcass of the tire, which of course weakened it. But when he hit that top speed, his tire let go. If this goes too far, the tire can delaminate too when the layer of tread comes away from the tire's main structure. And this does massive damage to the car as the loose layers flap around at high speed. And this happened to Mansell in 1986. As his tire let go, it caught in his suspension, bending it so much that he had to retire. So really, it's amazing that tires don't explode more. If you've ever wondered how a driver can help keep their tires alive, check out this video on why Perez is incredible at saving tires.